This video is sponsored by Only Crits. This year, Cobalt Press re-released their 5th edition monster book, Tome of Beasts 1, and they sent me a PDF to review for the channel. They didn't sponsor the video, they just wanted me to share my thoughts about the product. This book originally came out in 2016, so the revision draws on a lot of lessons learned over the past 7 years of 5e. The changes are pretty minor. From what I can tell, the most obvious change seems to be that they swapped a few monsters out, and there's just a lot more art in the book overall. Now, this book doesn't have a huge thesis about how to handle 5e. It's just an extremely thorough supplement with more than 400 monsters. And we're not going to be able to review this book the way that we might with a lot of other products by summarizing the lessons or simplifying its approach. So instead, I thought it would be fun to just share some of my favorite monsters from this book. Now, honestly, I need to give myself some criteria in order to pick my favorites. Otherwise, I'll be here literally all day. So I'm going to give myself some categories. I'll pick one monster that has my favorite name, one monster that has my favorite art, one monster that has my favorite lore, one monster with my favorite stat block feature. That's kind of a weird one, but basically, what's something that's in the stat block, like an ability or a reaction or whatever, that makes me excited about using the monster in games. And the final category, my favorite monster that I'm only excited about because I just watched my wife play through a bunch of God of War Ragnarok. So let's roll up our sleeves and play with some monsters. Did somebody say, roll dice? What? No, 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 I said roll up my roll sleeves. Roll dice? Like the dice from today's sponsor, Only Crits? What? No. What? Only Crits is a wonderful dice company that offers a fantastic selection. If you're getting ready to play in a Midgard campaign, you're going to want some dice to capture that aesthetic. My favorite pick would be the Radiant Prismatic Dragon Hollow set. They're metal so you get the satisfying feeling of cold steel, but they're also rainbow colored to remind you of the Rainbow Bridge or the Unhajar. And of course, they've got a dragon, and that could totally be the World Serpent. And if you want these dice, or any other set of dice, they've got a whole bunch, then visit OnlyCrits.com slash SuperGeekMike. And if you use the promo code SuperGeek at checkout, you can save 12% off your order. An additional portion of the money you give to Only Crits actually gets passed along to me to help support this channel. Once again, visit OnlyCrits.com slash SuperGeekMike and use the promo code SuperGeek for 12% off your order. Thank you so much to Only Crits for sponsoring this video. Thanks, Scary Ceiling Voice. Let's kick things off with the monster with my favorite name. Content warning for bugs in this section. Jump to this time code to avoid it. But yeah, it's honestly no contest. The best name in this entire book is the Militar. Much like how a Minotaur is half man and half bull, this creature is half man and half many-legged bug. They seem to be territorial, but otherwise helpful, and this is actually represented in their stat block. They have poisonous saliva, which they coat their hand axes with, and they also carry a poison flask that they can throw. But they also have a healing tonic action. This is the only monster stat block I've ever seen where one of their possible actions is to feed someone a healing potion. The runner-up for the best name, by the way, has to go to... Baba Yaga's Henchman. This is obviously for a totally different reason. In this case, the name just evokes so many cool details and, and even questions about who these guys are and what role they could take in the campaign. They also work a lot like the Horsemen of Apocalypse in X-Men comics, where different people can take on these roles by making a deal with the Baba Yaga. I definitely have some ideas for how to use these three in a future campaign, and honestly, like a lot of the things in this book, they make me excited to check out the Cobalt Press Midgard campaign setting. But sorry guys, you would have had this one in the bag if it wasn't for the Militar. Next, we're moving on to the monster with my favorite art in the book. And this is actually super hard. The art in this book is terrific. Do we go with Hrezvalder, the corpse swallower, a giant who carries coffins and also sometimes turns into a gigantic bird? The horde golem, just for being a perfect action shot of a monster about to ruin some adventurer's day? The cobalt alchemist for those fantastic green highlights? The subek for just being a crocodile person, enough said? Those are all good, and honestly, there are so many more options, but there's also no question about my favorite. It's the shark jaw skeleton. It's a relatively low level undead, but it's also a skeleton made out of the jaws of sharks. They're reanimated by Sahogan priests, so they can be a great minion in a Sahogan adventure. But also, even if they're just among other skeletons... I mean, come on, it's a skeleton made of shark jaws. How do you not love it? My runner up here, and content warning for eyeball stuff. Click here to avoid an image of some gross eyeball doing gross eyeball things. Okay, yeah, so my favorite runner up option was the Oculo Swarm. You might think that this is Cobalt Press's riff on the Beholder, or even something lower level like a spectator, but no. This is just a swarm of magic eyes, and they can take your eyes and add them to its swarm of eyes. It's so gross. I love it. And it's only CR4, so you really don't have to wait that long to throw one at your party. But make sure to check with your players, see how they feel about eyeball stuff, because I have a few friends whose entire day would be ruined if they saw this picture. Next, let's talk about the monster who has the best lore, or rather, my favorite lore. And for me, I'm actually going to call this one a tie. The first monster I want to talk about is the Vile Barber. 
Yes, the art is great, but I actually love their backstory more. They're sadistic fae who lurk in the dark, so yeah, enjoy your nightmares. But they're actually sent to punish the mortals who offend fae lords and ladies, leaving gruesome messages in their blood. And I love that. They're not rogue agents or bad actors, they're here to enact the will of the fae. Quote, They scar those who have spoken ill of the fae, and they slowly bleed out those who have harmed or murdered the fae. Some of these deaths are made quite public to reinforce the power of the Barber's Lord. One reason I hardly ever incorporate Fae into my campaign is because it's really challenging to introduce low-level Fae who feel like they can act as representatives of a Fae Lord. Like, the Red Cap doesn't feel like it has anything to do with Oberon, at least not in the same way that an imp can be easily linked to, like, a Baylor through Wheels Within Wheels of Infernal Machinations. But the Vile Barber is only CR2, and they can act as the representatives for anyone from the Unseely or the Seely Courts. For example, maybe someone from the local village turns up dead at the hands of the Vile Barber, and that's how the players get involved. And by doing so, they can wind up in a very Fae-centric story at very low levels. Another cool angle here is that the Vile Barbers look like goblins, so if you want to enhance the connection between Fae and goblins, who are now Fae in the core rules, then the Vile Barber is a terrific way to link them together. But for me, the Vile Barber is actually tied for favorite lore with the White Ape. Now, for a bit of context, earlier this year I made a video about the Hadozi and 5e Spelljammer book, and how I think they were mishandled and the designers ended up accidentally including some racist rhetoric. But one of the comments I get all the time on that video is that the Hadozi are just a Planet of the Apes reference. And first of all, that wouldn't excuse the issue if they still seem kind of racist, but that's not the point. The point is, if you want to see a great Planet of the Apes riff, check out the lore for the White Ape. Their backstory includes a nation of mages who awakened the apes to serve as soldiers or servants, which does sound pretty similar. But first of all, the White Apes weren't intended to be traded and sold in the same way the Hadozi were, so that's pretty different. But second... These mages were also dying, and they used the awakened apes to replace the dying mages as their civilization crumbled. And eventually, the mages were dead and gone, leaving the white apes behind. So there's another difference. It sure seems like the white apes still have a homeland in this mage city they took over. The apes also didn't experience any physical changes, like the Hadozi who became stronger and able to endure more pain, which evoked some uh, unpleasant comparisons. Uh, these apes' fur just turned white, and honestly, some apes just have white fur in our world. Although it's possible this is actually a reference to the uh, white apes from the John Carter book series, I'm not sure. But here comes my favorite part. Remember how the mages were dying? Well, the white apes carry that same disease, and it can infect other spellcasters they interact with. And it afflicts these spellcasters with a disease that reduces the target's intelligence and wisdom and eventually kills them. The apes actually want to interact with other humans or humanoids, but because they can't interact with spellcasters without killing them, they usually get treated with a lot of hostility, so they're defensive and can sometimes be pretty aggressive, especially towards spellcasters. So to recap, we have a culture of apes that were given intelligence and rose up to take over a dying civilization of humans, and whenever humans interact with them, they get sick and lose their intelligence. That kind of sounds like a Planet of the Apes reference to me. I was originally going to put the white apes down as a runner-up, but as I wrote the script, I realized, no, actually, I like them a lot more than I realized. I have a lot to say about them. So yeah, we'll call that one a tie. Next, let's talk about the monster with my favorite stat block feature. And again, it's a tie. The first one is one that is just so obviously one of my favorite monsters in the entire book. It's the Grim Jester. Does it have the best stat block? Who knows? Who cares? The Grim Jester is just 1,000% my trash. I love undead, I love all types of undead, and I love the Grim Jester so much. Honestly, the Grim Jester had my heart from the moment I saw the art, but that's not why I love the Grim Jester. Grim Jesters are the reanimated remains of jesters who, on their deathbed, managed to get a laugh out of an evil death god, so they got brought back as an undead jester. Per the flavor text, their purpose is to bring an end to mortal lives in a gruesome, comedic, and absurd manner. As long as such jesters keep the death god amused, their continued unlife is assured. The book goes on to say that the mortals don't find Grim Jesters funny, which is kind of nice. It takes the burden off the GM to actually run a comedic character. Grim Jesters also enjoy randomness and love magic items that cause randomness, like the Wand of Wonder or the Deck of Many Things, which is described as this book as like the worst case scenario for the Grim Jester to get its hands on. So yeah, it's basically an undead version of the Joker, and that alone would be bad enough. But that's not why I love the Grim Jester. Let's look at the stat block. First of all, they are CR 11, which is pretty nasty. Second, they'll always come back after they die, unless they die in a way that amuses the evil god of death they serve. So it's actually not only in the interest of the Grim Jester to die in the funniest way it can, but the players can also try to kill it in whatever they think might be the funniest way, in the hopes of getting rid of the Grim Jester for good. But of course, will the players be able to guess the evil death god's sense of humor? Who knows? And in fact, that challenge is similar to something I've always wanted to do with another undead enemy that I've got under my hat, so for that reason, because of that comparison, I automatically love the idea that the Grim Jester is performing for an audience of one. But that's not why I love the Grim Jester. 
If we stick with the stat block, we can see another Joker comparison here. It's got a power called a killing joke, which doesn't do what the killing joke did in the comics. This power does not ruin DC Comics for several decades. Instead, it's a bit like Tasha's hideous laughter, but it also deals necrotic damage every subsequent turn. That's a really fun power. But that's not why I love the Grim Jester. Instead, I want to focus on my favorite power in the stat block, Joker's Shuffle, Recharge 6. It's a bonus action, and it allows the Grim Jester to swap places with another target, and they both become disguised as each other, so that way you end up attacking your allies instead of the Grim Jester, and that's why I love this power. A lot of us who grew up on TV have always wanted to do some version of the old, which one do you attack gimmick, but it's tough to do that in D&D. And while this is not that exactly, it's closer to a Freaky Friday situation, though thankfully it's just an illusion, this does still mess with the players in a similar way, and I really like it. It's so fun and chaotic. But I said before that the Grim Jester is tied with another monster that has a stat block feature that I really like. So let's talk about the Chained Angel. This is kind of a huge spoiler, so if you don't want to, if you don't plan to pick up this book and run these monsters, then cover your ears and hum to yourself for a minute. Or I guess skip to this time code, that's probably easier. But the Chained Angel is an angel that has been captured by fiends and forced to fight on their side. And they have a feature called Redemption. And I'm just going to read this to you. When a creature casts the knock spell on the Chained Angel's chains, the chains release a blast of unholy flame. The spellcaster must make a DC 16 dexterity saving throw, taking 16 3d10 fire damage and 16 3d10 radiant damage on a failed save, or half as much damage on a successful one. If the spellcaster survives, the Chained Angel must immediately make a DC 17 wisdom saving throw. On a success, the Angel's chains fall away. It is restored to its senses and the form it had before it was chained, typically a deva. On a failure, the Chained Angel remains chained for seven days, and during that time, any further attempt to cast Knock on the Angel's chains fail. That's right. This CR8 monster can not only be removed from combat, but can actually be flipped to fight on the player's side with the single casting of a second level spell. Of course, that assumes that your party even has this spell, and even then, they still have to think of it. And of course, if they're too low level to survive the 60, 10 fire and radiant damage, then it's a moot point. And they also only get one shot every seven days. But if all these things line up, then the party can recruit an angel with a single second level spell. And you might think that's overkill, but this depends on the story you're telling. First of all, it's never a bad idea to include more combat encounters that can't be solved by killing every enemy. You want to challenge the party in other ways. Like, casting a simple second level spell? Well, yeah, you're challenging them to think outside the bun and consider how the aesthetic you describe, as in the narrative descriptions of the party's enemies, can actually be exploited into a mechanical benefit. Of course, this also doesn't even mean that it's the end of the fight. Some of y'all who are familiar with Campaign 2 of Critical Role might be able to think of another encounter where an enemy was essentially, metaphorically, a chained angel of sorts, an ally whose will was not their own. But as soon as someone cast a single spell, it flipped that fight and turned that individual into a powerful ally. I'm trying to be as vague as I can be, but if you know, you know. Now, that moment made the fight much more likely to be won, but it was also an epic reward for the hard work the party did to free them. And again, there were still other forces to fight. The fight was not just over. Of course, it could also just be the end of the fight. I once had a GM throw a metallic dragon at us, and we didn't know why they were attacking, so we fought back to defend ourselves. This dragon had been killing innocent people in droves, so we figured they were just evil and bad. But it took us forever to realize that we needed to get the dragon's necklace off of it. And then once we did, the dragon was free, the fight was over, and we had a brand new metallic dragon ally. So yeah, once again, this is not a runner-up, I just really like the Chained Angel. It's actually tied with the Grim Jester. Now, the final category we're discussing today is the monster I'm excited about because of Norse mythology, aka because I watched my wife play a bunch of God of War Ragnarok. And Cobalt Press has a campaign setting called Midgard, where the nations are more directly inspired by real-world human cultures than you might even find in most D&D settings. I haven't read that setting yet, although I've always been really interested in it, and it is a setting that I would love to review at some point in the future. But the reason it's relevant is because there are some monsters in this book that are directly lifted from Norse mythology, even more so than usual. Because yeah, sure, D&D always includes some monsters from all sorts of mythologies, including Norse. But rather than just going with the obvious monsters linked with Scandinavian myth, like the Kraken, this book makes an honest effort to adapt some more specific creatures straight out of myth. We get stats for Ratatusk, which in this book is a type of creature and not a single magical squirrel, and for the Valkyries, of course. But my favorite two monsters in this category are the Enherjar and the Vater. Apologies for my pronunciation. Perhaps coincidentally, both of these creatures are undead warriors, because I have a type. The Enherjar uh, are warriors who were plucked up by Valkyries and now reside in Odin's halls. Odin can send them anywhere, but they tend to fight a lot of giants, and also they just tend to spend a lot of their time drinking. Every time they die, they just reappear in Odin's halls the next day, so obviously they've got no reason to fear death. 
if the party crosses paths with an unhear shar, I can imagine that would be an extremely interesting role-playing encounter, whether or not they wind up fighting it. The unhear shar can also call a Valkyrie to heal one unconscious creature nearby, and that's a rechargeable ability. So yeah, it'd be pretty good to get an unhear on your side. Although if a Valkyrie is on the field, things might start to get complicated because they have an ability that can turn fallen friends into an unhear So there's a possibility someone in the party will turn into a ghost in the halls of Odin. Which actually sounds pretty rad, come to think of it. Also, while we're on the subject of the Valkyries, is she riding on a winged wolf? Yeah, she is. I've never seen that detail before as part of the myth, but it's pretty badass. Now, despite also being undead warriors, the Vatir are very different and far more sinister. They're only CR4, but that's kind of perfect because among their other traits, they can rise from the dead when people steal from their horde, which means you could have the players explore a dungeon get their loot, and go back to town, and then a Vatir can emerge from the dungeon and start stalking them. But a Vatir just cares about the coins. They're like the pirates from Pirates of the Caribbean, minus the fixation on Bill Turner's kid. And they're going to follow the coins wherever they are, so if the heroes still have them, then they've got a monster after them. If they've spent the gold, then they maybe just got those vendors killed. Oh, and Vatir don't stay dead unless they're properly laid to rest, they'll keep coming back again and again until they're satisfied. What a cool monster, it immediately gives us a ton of story potential, particularly for a different type of low-level adventure, which would be a welcome break to the typical quest format very early on. Uh, thanks so much for watching, this was a fun one. If you've got this book yourself, then uh, let me know what are your favorite monsters in the book. Feel free to borrow the same criteria I used, or use your own rubric. I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked the video, then you know what to do. Like, subscribe, ring the bell. Uh, if you want to support me financially, you can do that on Patreon if you are able and interested. Uh, join my Discord server to hang out with other awesome people and sign up for my newsletter for news. And if you want to hear more about more monsters, uh, click here for a video about MCDM's new monster book, Flea Mortals. Until next time, play fair and have fun.